In this video, we'll go over the basics of the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model from Cowan and Tabarrok chapter 13. You will learn how to read the graph and learn how to draw the dynamic aggregate demand curve. Most textbooks use a different version of the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. They put the price level on the vertical axis and real GDP on the horizontal axis. This version of the model puts the rate of change of the price level on the vertical axis and the rate of change of real GDP on the horizontal axis. That is, this model is more dynamic because it starts from the assumption that the economy being studied usually has some inflation and some economic growth. This is a model of flows, not stocks. This allows for a more realistic description of the world. Developed economies like the U.S. tend to have low but positive inflation rates and modest economic growth. The more standard aggregate demand, aggregate supply model assumes zero inflation and zero growth as a baseline. It's possible to incorporate steady inflation and growth into that model, but it's much more cumbersome, so we're going to use this model. Now, Cowan and Tabarrok do something strange with the graph of this model, and I'm really not very happy with it. It causes unnecessary confusion. For some reason, they place the vertical axis at negative 2 instead of 0. You've all been drawing the vertical axis at 0 on graphs for as long as you've been drawing graphs. I guess maybe they want to emphasize that economic growth can be negative, but I think it's better to just say, hey, economic growth can be negative, than it is to draw a confusing graph. So to make this graph easier to read, we're going to shift the vertical axis to where it belongs, 0. Just remember when you're reading chapter 13 of Calhoun and Tabarrok, they put the vertical axis at negative 2 instead of 0. Remember the equation of exchange? We used it to talk about the relationship between money supply growth and inflation. We saw two versions of it. The first was in stocks, or levels. The second was in flows, or rates of change. Let's focus on the second one. Cowan and Tabarrok use little arrows over the letters to represent rates of change. It's common in other books to use the percent change symbols, but let's stick with Cowan and Tabarrok's notation. Now we're going to convert the equation of exchange into a graph. First, let's assume money supply growth is constant and assume velocity isn't growing at all. In fact, Let's go a step further and assume that money supply grows at exactly 7% each year. I could have picked any number, 5%, 2%, negative 3%, whatever. Let's just go with 7% and see what happens. If money supply grows at 7% and velocity is constant, then together they grow at a rate of 7%. To put it more simply, Spending in this economy grows at 7% every year because there is 7% more money each year than the last, because that's how fast the central bank prints money. But we know that the full equation is money supply growth plus velocity growth equals inflation plus real GDP growth. If the left-hand side of the equation is growing at 7%, then the right-hand side must also be growing at 7%. Now we have an equation we can graph. To draw this relationship, we are going to plot a bunch of points. Suppose that GDP is growing at a rate of zero. Stick a zero in for y, and you see that the inflation rate must be 7%. So we add a point to our graph. What if the economy grows at a rate of 1%? Then the inflation rate has to be 6, because 6 plus 1 equals 7. Again, we add a point to our graph. What if the economy grows at a rate of 2%? Then inflation has to be 5%, because 5 plus 2 equals 7. Again, we add a point to our graph. What if the economy grows at a rate of 3%? Then inflation has to be 4%. We can keep doing this, adding points to our graph. until we get all the way up to an economic growth rate of 7%. Actually, we can continue beyond that. Economic growth can be negative. 
If economic growth is negative 1%, then inflation has to be 8% because negative 1 plus 8 equals 7. Similarly, if economic growth were 8%, inflation would have to be negative 1%. That's deflation. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. If we connect the dots, we get a function that shows a negative relationship between economic growth and inflation for any given rate of spending growth, in this case, 7%. The relationship we just drew is the dynamic aggregate demand curve, or DAD. Mm, well, maybe uh, maybe let's call it let's call it dynamic aggregate demand, but we'll label it just AD. That's better. The dynamic aggregate demand curve shows us all the possible combinations of economic growth and inflation for a given rate of spending growth. Again, seven percent in this example. If I give you an economic growth rate, you can tell me the inflation rate that will occur. And if I tell you 2% economic growth, you can tell me that, inflation, that the inflation rate will be 5%. But what if we change the rate of spending growth? Suppose, for example, that the central bank decides to print money more slowly. Maybe it grows money supply at a rate of 4% instead of 7%. What happens? You could create another table, like we did a few minutes ago, and you could plot points. You would find that the line has shifted downward, or to the left. That is, it used to be that when the economy grew at a rate of 0%, inflation would be 7%. But now, if the economy grows at a rate of 0%, inflation will be only 4%, because the central bank is printing money more slowly. To summarize, Dynamic aggregate demand is a negative or downward sloping relationship between economic growth and inflation. For any given rate of spending growth, we can draw a dynamic aggregate demand curve. When the rate of economic growth changes, we move along the aggregate demand curve to a different inflation rate. If growth slows, inflation rises. If growth speeds up, inflation falls. When the rate of spending growth rises, the dynamic aggregate demand curve shifts. If money supply or velocity grow faster, dynamic aggregate demand shifts to the right. If money supply or velocity grows slower, dynamic aggregate demand shifts to the left. In the next video, we'll see other pieces of the model. Long run aggregate supply and short run aggregate supply.